Hey everybody, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome my uh, new good veterinary friend, brilliant veterinary friend, Dr. Shambro. Hello, Christina. How are you today? Oh, I'm great, and I'm so glad to be talking to people all around the world. I love Zoom technology. <laughs> no, me too. I, I do too. I mean, I, I believe me, I like, you know, occasionally we get to go to events and see people in, you know, real life 3D, but... This is amazing. It you know gets us to you have a lot more impact in a much shorter period of time, and also not have to run ourselves around ragged. You know, hop. It's it's not exactly easy these days to be on planes and everything. Most importantly, is people in a small African village. Yeah. Are on the internet. Yeah. And they can hear that. What they're doing is probably the best thing for their animals. And then they don't have to listen to the commercial stuff that's going to cost them a lot of money. Yeah. So it, teaching people everywhere is just wonderful. So just by way of introduction, you are a practicing holistic veterinarian. We're going to get into that. You're um, a very big proponent uh, for sustainability and the planet's health and you have a really amazing show um it's called all pause pet talk tv with rick palmquist who i know i don't know him personally yet but i know of him through my good friend marty goldstein who just thinks the world of him and um and, then and we, I, al we also have uh joan ranquette who her website is joanranquette.com, and mm -hmm. she's uh, the third panelist. She is the best in terms of animal communication and energy healing. And her 18-month course, actually, they go to shelters, and they go to horse rescues, and they work. They, while they're learning, they're helping animals. And she has a lot of shorter courses. And then um, Brendan Goya is our dog trainer. And then we have a wonderful host, Kat Michio, and she has a Frenchy, little French French um, bulldog called Lulu Lama. <laughs> wow, it's so, a good show. So, like you, we interview a whole lot of people, and it you know you can find us on YouTube right now. Soon we'll actually be on TV, but editing takes time. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. So my passion is really educating people. And um, I started out with the Hunger Project, actually, yeah. back in the early 80s, teaching the Ending Hunger Briefing. I had just graduated from veterinary school, and I didn't know I liked teaching. I didn't know I was good in front of the room. And uh, the Hunger Project people said, hey, you're good. How about teaching? How about helping us train the Ending Hunger Briefing leaders? So after I'd been doing holistic for a few years, and a client said, would you talk to my small church group, about 30 people? I was comfortable doing that, and that was the beginning. I did a PETA talk in 1988 that had over 100 people. It was a classroom full and people standing in the hallway listening. Luckily, I have a loud voice. And one of our leading homeopathic veterinarians, Dr. Wendy Jensen, uh, who wrote a great book, um, Practical Handbook of Veterinary Homeopathy, that walks you through how veterinarians do homeopathy with your animals. She was there in that room and I got probably 60% of the homeopaths I got started over the last 17 years. So yes, I love empowering people. That's my, that's what I do in practice and that's what I do everywhere I can. Hey there, this is Rob Ryan. I just want to say how much we enjoy making this content for you here. And if you are enjoying it, would you like our video down below and would you subscribe? To our YouTube channel. It sure does help us get discovered by more people like you who need information like this. And also down below in our description, the top link is to our trial pack. We hope you'll order one for your dog so your dog can have fermented superfoods that give them nutrition like they can't find anywhere else. Hard to get nutrients that are easily absorbed. Thank you very much. Now back to the show. That's amazing. So you and I both share this this passion for sustainability and, and, um, you know, what we do at our company is take into consideration everything we do in the health of the planet as, and I, I think that's a great way to be and a great way of, 
of moving through the world and, and um, especially running a business. And I know you, you feel the same way about, you know, our, our pets can be a, and, and the way we feel about our customers is they can be a force for good in terms of the planet. What's good for the health of our dogs and cats can be so for the planet. So um, why don't we talk about your background in sustainability and what, you know, really turned you on in that, in that realm? Okay, great. And, and then we'll move because it, it really is you are you do make most of the decisions for your animals. And yeah. so you can choose which way to go in everything you do. When I was 18, I was living in Princeton, New Jersey, uh, doing my senior year in high school. And I started using cloth bags. I don't remember why, but I've been using cloth bags ever since then. And I'm 73. So I've used them a long time. And when I was in my 80s, I took a course called The Natural Step, which uh, was a Swedish man who put together principles that are needed to live lightly on the planet, which are very similar to, um, hmm, drawing a blank on his name, you'll probably know it, Cradle to Cradle. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Uh, oh, gosh, I'm really not that great with names. But yes, that's and, and his the, the principles are very similar. Okay. And just prog- just slowly over the years, I have now mer- I'm now doing much more with indigenous cultures. And I encourage everybody. I really encourage you to read everything you can of the wise people in the world. Mm. And we're going to be talking about multiple places you can go for recordings, but a lot of them have recordings of people like Bernie Siegel, who says, love is all you need to heal. Well, love is super sustainable. You're not using stuff. Yeah. Um, We find that if animals are sniffing, they actually can heal. And so snuffle mats, people make snuffle mats. But if you're thinking environmentally, instead you go to YouTube and you find out how to make your own snuffle mat from leftover cloth you have in the house. And then you help your dog and you're helping the environment. Tell us what that is. A snuffle mat is cloth, long strips of cloth that are hooked together so it's like a flower. And you hide food in it or treats, your treats, would you would hide in it and then the dog goes <laughs> to find them. And so it's a good cold weather, rainy weather, you know, when you live in places you can't go outdoors all the time yeah. uh, to help them <sighs> breathe more. So sustainability is really about the decisions you make. Yeah. Um, and I know that you've had a lot of guests talking and have the leader, Ian Billinghurst, coming up on this, um, talking about feeding fresh food. Yeah. Now, think for a moment about commercial food, whether it's raw food diet, yeah, frozen, whether it's frozen raw food diet, or whether it's your kibble. Yeah. So the kibble... Whatever the label says, you have no idea what's in it. Ingredients come from all over the world. They're shipped to a plant. It does a lot of energy using stuff. It's shipped out to distributors. I'm sorry, to wholesalers that ship it out to distributors. Look at all the energy that's wasted in addition to you don't know what's in it and how those ingredients were raised. And most of them really are crap. Now, you think, but I'm buying frozen organic uh, raw food diet much better much better for your dog's health but still yeah think about the difference environmentally what's the footprint the environmental footprint of a company that's getting their ingredients hopefully from regenerative agriculture but not always and then they're making it yeah and and it's not it's often ground which isn't how animals eat normally yeah. Their teeth need things to sink into. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just giving you a comparison here. Sure. Um, and then it's packaged, shipped to wholesalers, shipped to distributors, and then you pick it up and you unwrap it and have to throw away the packaging. Yeah. As opposed to you 
are really committed already to the environment. You want to do things good for the environment. So many young people do these days. And you go to farmer's markets. Yep. At the farmer's market, you can buy, and, and you have three big Dobermans, or you have two um, Bernese Mountain Dogs, and you say, I can't afford raw food. It's too expensive. But at the farmer's market, you make friends with the farmer. The farmer's coming there anyway and hopefully doing good land work. Yep. At the end of the day, they have vegetables that are ready to go, that they're ready to give away. You can have a conversation with them about getting chicken feet, chicken heads, chicken backs, chicken necks, liver, heart, tongue, things that try right. kidneys, all of that. And you're buying it directly from them. Yep. And so think about the lower cost to the environment. You're including your dog as a member of your family on the grocery shopping list. Yeah. And your cost will decrease. Number two is there are a lot of people who like to hunt. And in many areas, there's an overabundance of wild game. So the, they don't always want all the meat. And so if you find the, the companies that butcher the hunted meat, you just pay the processing fee and you need a freezer. <laughs> Dr. Shiro, you are 100% speaking my tune. I just thought a couple days ago, could I put together some kind of co-op all over the uh, country? We'll focus on America first. But having some kind of situation that plugged in hunters mm -hmm. to people mm -hmm. and certainly farmers markets. And one of the things you said that that is resonated so strongly with me is uh, looking your farmers and your ranchers in the eye, shaking their hand, building relationships with them. Mm -hmm. Building relationships with your vets, building relationships with your pet store owner. Um, these are incredibly important. The, the things that come out of these relationships are so valuable. And um, I just, I think people don't, I know people in my life that know me really well and hear me talking about these things all the time and they still don't do it. They just don't get it. They, it it's yeah. so invaluable. But back to the, the hunters, <clears throat> the quality of meat that comes from like a, an, an elk or a deer, a lot, you know, deer, that quality of meat is so different. So, so, so different mm -hmm. than even organic regenerative, you know, cow, um, yep. produced locally. Uh, I can't not stress that enough. And, and, and most of the, um, farmers or sorry, uh, hunters, they're not, I, yeah, they, some of them might be eating liver, but they're not really eating a lot of the offal. And dogs and cats will eat it like nobody's business. It's a great thing. So, and shopping locally, I, I'm a thousand percent in your corner. I, I mean, just it, it, anybody who hears it immediately knows that is just the way to be. So it, it's the way to go. And even, so many of my clients, so for, um, 40 years, I was the homeopathic vet for people. Now I do pet health coaching, which is more of a one-off yeah. um, visit to get you started on the path you need to be on or make course corrections. Yeah. And I Early on, I had a client from New York City, and I started talking about <laughs> feeding fresh food. And, and he said, uh, I don't have a kitchen. Yeah. And I went, what? And he said, I have a dorm-sized refrigerator and a hot plate. Well, what do you eat? I eat out all the time. I said, oh, good. So here's what you do. So again, you can help the environment yeah. by the restaurants that you go to. Find out if there's a way. Get to know them, as you say. Get to know the owners really well. The small restaurants, the little mom and pop ones. And mm -hmm. maybe you can pick up the cook. It doesn't matter if the meat's cooked or raw. A wide variety of food is great. So yeah. maybe you can pick mm -hmm. up meat, buy from them, help them out. A lot of it is now going to soup kitchens, really. There is a lot of food distribution, food pantries, things like that, but not always. And if you're going to the same restaurant all the time, you might be able to work something out. So the key is to think what uses the least 
what takes the least from the environment. Yeah. So in terms of preventing illness, just think if you could prevent all illness, you've helped the environment. Yeah. Because you aren't doing having to do treatments. Yeah. If you can learn yourself, and there's an explosion of this happening. I love it. If you can learn energy healing techniques yourself, yeah. then you, with your hands alone and your heart and your your mental thinking, you'll be able to heal your animals. And that's the very best for the environment because when you're doing healing thoughts like that, the indigenous people teach us that as you're doing that, you're healing everything around you. You're not, everything's connected. So when you're focused on healing your animal, you're also healing the plants in your yard and maybe the stars as well. So a lot of people, unfortunately, I can say categorically, if you have an ill animal and you do homeopathy or good Chinese veterinary medicine, acupuncture, Chinese herbs, et cetera, Mm -hmm. you have a high chance of resolving the problem, if not a complete cure, having good quality of life. I can't say that yet about any one of the energy healing modalities. Mm -hmm. They all help some deeply cure, but I can't say go learn this one. Okay. Um, And so if your animals aren't very ill, though, definitely dig in and, well, before they get ill, starting ahead of time, um, offering energy healing every day. And there's there's a huge variety of different ones. I bet you have speakers on that yourself. Yeah. So tune yeah. them into that. The more, the better. Yeah. The, let's go back to the ancient ways and the healers and tribes and all the best uh, – I mean, you look at like Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine is thousands and thousands of years old. And, um, you know, the indigenous folks that people that lived, um, you know, for just hundreds and hundreds of years doing all sorts of things that we're now starting to reconnect with, like our more modern healers like yourself, you know, they're, they're, they're bringing up and, and, um, you know, all this stuff in human medicine that I, you know, these podcasts I listen to between things like ayahuasca and, you know, these herbals, the plants. I mean, these aren't things I've ever done, but boy, I'll tell you, people are getting crazy good results in a lot of cases with them. These are all really old methods. And I mean, we, we, more modern medicine is, I think, done a really interesting job with the mechanical surgeries and cutting people up, uh, or cutting, you know, our animals and our people, you know, us up and and helping us, um, through surgery, but all the other medicine just seems to really be targeted at convenience. And now a big theme of, of, of our show here is one of the things that we constantly see is this, this, uh, prioritization of convenience is really getting us in more trouble than it's actually helping us. So I know I just you know wanted to just well, lay that out there. Rather than, rather than convenience, what happened is, and and I also want to put a new light on the modern use of indigenous ways. Okay. Because what modern medicine does is say, oh. Willow bark stops fevers. So let's find the active ingredient in willow bark and manufacture it and give it to everybody. Yeah. And yet the indigenous person, the shaman, the healer, would have a person in front of them and intuit from the gods that this person needed willow bark. Not that person, not that person. Yeah. And then they would go out and they would pray to the willows and they would say, who wants to help heal this person? And they might pick one leaf Mm. and then the intention was all that was needed to heal. So Mm. while it's good that we're doing more herbal and plastic surgeons are using Arnica all the time, that's good, but it's more, it's still the modern medicine is symptom oriented, get rid of symptoms. So 
there is, everybody does want things to be easy because they're busy. So they do want convenience. But the problem with medicine is it's based on get rid of symptoms. My dog is itching. Let's stop the itch. Whether we're doing a steroid or a Tellington Tea Touch wrap or flower essences topically or an herb, we're still trying to stop the skin itching as opposed to realizing that each of us has an inherent energy field, chi, prana. And when that's off balance, it wants to go back into homeostasis. It wants to go back into balance. So what it does is creates a symptom. Now, if you're a dog and you're living in a village where there's not a lot of money, yeah. and the, but you're living in nature and you get sick, you eat something, you, you blew it and you ate something that was a little poisoned, you do get sick and you go off in the woods and you fast for three days because you yeah. feel punk and you don't want to eat. And maybe somebody sits with you and gives you some love and yeah. then you recover. Yeah. And that energy field is back in balance again, as opposed to stopping the diarrhea with a drug or even some holistic treatments. Or which an the weakness in the energy field is still there. Yeah. So that's the key is you always want to be focusing on all the symptoms that an animal has ever had from day one. Yeah. And so um, my part, a friend of mine, Dr. Jeff Feynman, created Holistic Actions. And it's a membership website to help you stay the holistic path, to learn what you can do holistically. Yeah. And he loves acronyms. So he came up with HMDM. Yeah. It stands for Holistic Medical Decision Making. Three steps. One, set a goal. My dog is having seizures and they aren't stopping. I want them to stop right away. I'm going to give Belladonna homeopathically. I'm going to send some Reiki while we're driving to the vet. Okay. Or my dog is urinating a lot, drinking a lot, and seems to have a pot belly. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start sending energy medicine while I go to the conventional or holistic vet to get blood work, x-ray, diagnosis to find out what's going on. But then... I'll stop. And even there, I'll say, which tests are really needed? Mm. So step one is the goal. Deeply healing or getting rid of that emergency symptom, bloat, yeah. for instance. You go to the vet, but you do stuff on the way. Yeah. Number two is research. The key thing in research is your animal's symptoms. They are the clue to what's going to be needed, number one. And number two, they're the clue that tells you whether your choices are helping or not helping. Okay. And so you record all the symptoms that have ever been there in the past. Yep. And the current symptoms. And another Dr. Jeff Feynman acronym, BEAM, behavior, energy, appetite, and mood. Mm. How are they feeling overall? We yep. are in diarrhea, but they're running around and playing and having fun. Okay. Then you stop and think of the context. What happened yesterday? Oh, it was Thanksgiving. Maybe he ate a lot too much and too much excitement. Let's fast him for a day. Let's, you know, maybe give him something to soothe his stomach, some aloe, and see what happens in the next few days. Don't panic. Be yep. patient. Yeah, be patient. And so to help you track the symptoms... After I'd been in practice about 25 years, clients kept saying, write a book, write a book. And I went, there's enough basic books out there. Marty Goldstein's book, Richard Pickerens. There's There are plenty of different choices out there. And I'm not going to write a book. And then I realized what was missing was helping people track the symptoms. Yeah. So I wrote the Healthy Animals Journal. Mm -hmm. And it's a print book. So it's... Um, and you put a picture of your pet on the cover in the picture frame. And then you get a, a master symptom list. And you don't need the book to do this. And 15 years before Jeff came up with his beam, my first symptoms were overall energy, emotional state, and appetite. <laughs> wow. So, And then you have what we call early warning signs of internal imbalance. So these are things in dogs, cats, horses, and other species 
where we have come to think as veterinarians and as lay people that it's normal to have to give a dog, many dogs need bathing frequently because they stink. Nope, healthy dogs never need a bath unless they go roll in something and then they need a bath or your mother-in-law is coming or your visitor, you know, and you want them to look pristine. But yep. the stinky dog, cats vomiting hairballs, healthy cats don't vomit hairballs. Right. Healthy animals don't have tear drugs, even in smushed face animals. Healthy animals don't have tartar on their teeth, things like that. So the next thing, so you've done past symptoms, current symptoms, beam and early warning signs of illness. Mm -hmm. And then you research anywhere, read books. I recommend having some books. Don't just do the internet. And, um, and, and do the internet as well. If you're a member of Holistic Actions, you have six years worth of courses and um, speakers. We have over a hundred, let's see, we have three times or four times, we have 50 speakers a year. So, you know, we've got 300 talks that you can listen to on these topics, wow. um, as well as posting questions in the forum. So you can research that way. So you read books, you talk to friends, maybe you have your holistic vet, you might have an animal intuitive that's helping you figure out what's going on with your animals and what's needed. And then you, you got your data, you sit down with it and you breathe and you relax and you don't panic. Yep. And so step three is take action. But first you create an action plan. Maybe it's like I say, fasting for 24 hours. And then 24 hours later, you reevaluate, you run through all the symptoms, what changed. It might be having a consult with a homeopathic veterinarian. And you think, oh, well, they'll take care of this, but you're living with your animals 24 seven. So you record in the journal what's changing. And then, and then you learn how to tell the difference. Yeah. Animals, people only respond in four ways to anything you do. Treatment, food change, exercise change, etc. They may not change at all. They might, the symptom itching might go away, but only if you keep doing the treatment. Yep. But they're no better overall. Mm -hmm. The itching may go, and that's called palliation. Yep. So nothing, palliation. The itching may go away, but they develop a worse symptom. Liver disease, if they were given steroids. Um, pancreatitis. Um, yep. Mental change. I prescribed very carefully a homeopathic medicine for an itchy dog who'd been itching for two or three years. And two weeks later, she said, Dr. Champro, you're a miracle worker. And I went, uh-oh, not good. In two weeks... Three years of itching is not going to naturally heal itself. The ant, you're triggering the animal to heal itself. You're not addressing the symptoms. You're addressing the energy field. It took prodding, but the dog had started biting the children. Mm. Oops. So that was suppression. Wow. So I then took that symptom, which wasn't caused by the remedy. It just pushed, it just brought out another symptom that was there in the dog and the okay. itching. And the, the uh, aggressive behavior went away immediately because it was new. The itching took another month before it was gone, but it slowly resolved. And then finally, what we want is a cure. The symptoms slowly resolve. The early warning signs that have been there their whole life go away. Their yeah. beam is great. Or they're moving towards a cure. You have an 18-year-old cat that is in kidney failure. We may not cure them so the values are back to normal completely. We may have to keep giving some treatments or some fluids, but their quality of life, all the symptoms can go away or most of them can go away and you still have to do a little bit of treatment, but it's not palliating because they're feeling better overall okay. and old little clues are disappearing and they're feeling better. So that's... That is why you can do this energy treatment at home. That's why you can take an experiment with using fermented foods to rehabilitate the microbiome in the gut. That's why you can try doing exercise. You can try something different because you now have a framework 
to evaluate how you're doing. Yeah. That's the key. And most importantly, you have a framework to evaluate how your veterinarian is doing. Yeah. Because just because there people come to me, I mean, you know, I'm sort of a star in the field of homeopathy and I can't cure everything. Sure. I'm humble enough that I refer people and sometimes they just change the potency and they get better. Sometimes mm. they need a different remedy uh, or sometimes they need something else, Chinese medicine or something. But this gives you a framework uh, where you can then be in charge of your animal's health. And then, of course, they're the basics. I mean, we all agree that to live sustainably on the planet, we want to minimize toxins. Mm. That means minimize vaccines. Mm -hmm. We want to feed the freshest food. We've talked about that already and minimize our impact on the environment with food. But that doesn't mean there's a right diet. Yeah. On the internet for people and for animals and in books, there is do the Weston Price diet, do the keto diet. There is feed raw meaty bones and never anything else. There is Dr. Pickaren, feed a vegetarian diet. Mm -hmm. um, and great examples and real, well worked out. So even though the natural diet for a dog and a cat is they've got ripping and tearing teeth, bone crunching teeth, and these little incisors in the front that fall out so easily are gnawing teeth. So they're there, provide a great big bone. They're not going to try to chew on the bone, but they'll nibble off the uh, cartilage and the meat on it. And that helps these teeth. Yes. And then they don't chew their food. So you want to puree the vegetables and fruit for nutrition leave them whole for treats. So those are really the, those are the main keys. Yeah. It's just common sense. And you learn things all the time. And please never, ever feel guilty when you learn something new. Like Dr. Rick on um, All Paws Pet Talk TV and our speaker, I forget who the speaker was, and they started talking about memory foam mattresses that are in dog beds and that that can totally ruin your hormonal system. Yep. But it doesn't, yeah. all, doesn't do that in all animals. Yeah. Um, so there's no one right answer. And just because you did, you did that doesn't mean you caused the problem. Yeah. Just because you vaccinated or fed kibble, or it doesn't mean you caused the problem. Yeah. And more, more importantly is your mental attitude and your thinking. A woman who was running a cat behavior listserv in the early, um, in the late 90s, she absolutely says, cats eat insects all day long. I leave dry kibble out, free choice, which is to me the worst thing you can do. Yeah. But I'm open. There's no run right answer. I said, so tell me about your cat's health. Well, let's see. Five of them lived to be 24, three recently to 22. Okay. The man in Austin, Texas, the plumber, whose cat lived to be 38, documented by the veterinary clinic. His other cat is 34. This was four or five years ago. He was feeding dry food with turkey bacon, some egg, and because he'd heard it was good for people, a dropper full of red wine and a dropper full of coffee. <laughs> And the cat lived to be 38. <clears throat> so there's no one right answer. So never feel guilty. There is no one right answer. But that framework I gave you, yeah. whatever you're doing, if you're seeing more early warning signs, if they yeah. seem to be getting older, yeah. then they aren't living the right lifestyle. Yeah. I mean, the fact that I have gray hair means that somewhere along the line, I am not doing, have not done what is really needed by my body. Mm. Now, on the other hand, I'm 73 and I'm not on any drugs at all. Yeah. So I've also done something right along the line. So we, we, we keep going, but having that framework is what really helps you. And, and finding companies like Gussie's Gut that give you products that are the best they can possibly do. And 15, 20 years from now, Rob may come up and say, wow, we shouldn't have been using that packaging. Now it turns out that packaging causes problems. Yeah. But he was doing the best he could at the time.
I'm not saying you're doing everything wrong, but we never know over time. So finding great sources um, for support and for products is really important too. Yeah. Now you're you're bringing up a bunch of really key things for me. Uh, I want to go into um, the extension of your process that you just went through. HMBM. Yes, but how to find a great holistic vet. I want to do that. But I also want to go backward just a quick second <laughs> about being sustainable, removing toxins where we can. One of the things I feel people don't quite have spent enough time just considering is what their pets are eating, what those animals eat and the treatments they got. And I don't think people are aware of how many times the, those animals are injected with antibiotics and hormones and, 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 and vaccinated every year or, you know, all of these things are going into the meat and mm-hmm. the meat is then getting turned into whatever, you know, kibble or, or something else. Um, to just share with us how you think about clean products. And it's not just the meat. Um, no. No. We used to think that the main problem was with GMO foods, which I recently found just really started like in, in 95. Yeah. I mean, it's not, I thought it was around forever. It's, it's amazing how fast it's grown. And so I thought the problem was with glyphosate being, you know, these are GMO foods are raised, are bred so that the corn, you can spray the glyphosate on the, on the ground and the corn will grow and the weeds won't grow. Right. So I thought that, you know, avoid GMO, avoid glyphosate that way. And now what I found out is worse than that is glyphosate is a wonderful desiccant. And so they spray particularly grains mm-hmm. and think about what's in kibble food is grains They spray a lot of the grains two weeks before harvesting. So if you look at a graph, the amount of glyphosate in corn and soy is not very much. The amount of glyphosate in chickpeas, that means hummus. Don't buy hummus at the grocery store unless it's organic. I I was buying regular hummus. Lentils. Lentils, all of those. So so it's not just the meat. but it, it really is everything we eat these days. That's why I'm getting back actually to the um, energy healing approaches. Mm-hmm. Because we are, 70% of the rain has glyphosate in it. And glyphosate causes huge problems, health problems. And then there are all these other chemicals And we don't even know how to avoid them. And we would drive ourselves crazy trying to avoid them too much. So do the best you can. If all you can afford to buy, if you're running a rescue and you're rescuing animals from being killed and all you can afford is the donated food that's kibble, then you feed the kibble. However, what you can do is learn Reiki or other energy approaches and every bag do Reiki on it. You can actually get rid of toxins with energy medicine. And if you offer Reiki, I say Reiki because it's readily available to learn. And there's a great organization, Sarah, you need to have one of them speak for you, Shelter Animal Reiki Association. Okay. And if you offer Reiki to all living beings in your house every day, or you offer scalar energy, or you offer loving healing if you do any of these every day and emoto did all this research a japanese scientist on water and speaking nicely to water yeah i've seen those underneath your pet's water bowl right thank you water for keeping your pet's names healthy same thing under the food bowl same thing on your water i have it on my water jug um there are so many things you can do to help avoid the problems of the toxicity that is there. So do your best, but remember that sometimes your best is completely free and has no cost to the environment. Yeah. 
Now, if you can support a local regenerative farm, kudos, do that. I A local farm here started and they were struggling a little bit. And so I volunteered once a week for two or three hours, as long as I could, I have some mobility issues. So as long as I could sort of hang, stand and I was prepping the vegetables and washing them and taking the sort of, if they had bug holes in them off, well, I'd take those home to eat myself. Yeah. And so you can find ways to save money. And maybe you have to start rethinking your life. I highly recommend a book where Bishop Desmond Tutu, who is now deceased, and the Dalai Lama are interviewed for a week. They spend a week together, and it's called The Book of Joy. Hmm. And they've done a movie about it as well. And that is focusing on, regardless of where you are in life, take time, spend the time, maybe reorganize your life. And there's so many other, I mean, so many other ones out there. Um, No matter your circumstances. I mean, if you think about the Tibetan circumstance, they're horrific. Mm -hmm. And yet they all have joy. Yeah. So it's your mindset about that. That's that's really the key. Yeah. Realignment. Yes. So I forget where we were going to realign to there. There was another piece. That's great. No, we were talking about um, we were talking about clean products. <clears throat> One of the things that brings that you just brought up, which is the eating the the crops with the holes in it or whatever. You know, our, our at our company, we we have this pets times planet um, philosophy, which is we're using the power of our pets, our customers, pets, uh, to bring in good things for the planet and what's good for the health of our pets can be good for the health of our planet. So we work with regenerative and we're also working to bring food waste out of farms because what we do is we, you know, we could take a, We could take a squash, let's say, that, you know, looks really horribly shaped that a grocery store won't buy. Those get weeded out. And a lot of times they have to just be composted or thrown out and the farmer loses the money on that. And that's all that's they spend a lot of money and a lot of energy on that. So we we want to take that food waste out of the environment and put it to good use. This is the same organic and biodynamic regenerative crops from the same it just Mm -hmm. just, you know it got got a little sunburnt or it got it just grew in a in a way that people Mm -hmm. just don't want to buy it silly but it's the it's the way it is so i appreciate you bringing that up um yeah yeah there's so many ways and and here's the thing many of you are out there going oh animals are getting sicker my animals gotten sicker and oh the world's not doing well people are bad subscribe to good news channel subscribe to Find friends that tell you the good things. So many wonderful things are happening. What you're doing, Rob, to to bring that food in is great. And there are food soup kitchens that'll do that. And they'll use that food to cook because the people don't want to buy, don't want to pick it up even when it's free sometimes if it looks like that. But they can cook with it. And so lots, there's so much is being done. And so much is being done for rescue animals. There's a Chihuahua Rescue Ranch and the key there is they take these chihuahuas. I learned, to me, a chihuahua was a, a lap pet. Wrong. They take these, they rescue old and hurting chihuahuas. And those that can, the husband takes them on a three to four hour hike in the New Mexico mountains. The wife takes those that can't on a very slow sniff walk. No, it's like use what you have, learn these good, they're rescuing and they limit the number they can rescue because, and here's another good tip for you. They, they say, and I forget the exact number now, it's either six or eight minutes of slow, that isn't even too fast, very slow stroking maximizes oxytocin production. So they limit the number of chihuahuas they can have by how many they can do that with during the day. Cute. That's amazing. 
So there's tons, there's tons of good news out there and yeah. there's support for you. So the trick is all of you listening, wherever you are in the world, whatever you're doing, start now to go back to your indigenous roots, to look for in, to look for energetic healing approaches that you can learn. And one of them is just love. Learn how to not worry and be stressed yourself. Our emotions, and many studies have shown this now, our emotions are way out here and our thoughts physically can be measured way out here and cause an impact. So therefore, the better you can do, the better you are. And, and then most importantly, remember that animals come into your life, they are on their journey. And it may be a torturous journey of health. And you're there, they came so you could learn something, but also so they could learn something. Yep. So it's sort of accepting what is while you do the best you can at the moment. And Book of Joy, find ways to enjoy every moment. Yeah. Another fun series is by David Nietzsche, M-I-C-H-E, mm -hmm. um, The Dalai Lama's Cat, The Queen's Corgi. There's a whole series he's done. <laughs> so keep reading. Keep reading positive things. Yeah, stay out of the, the – you, you uh, mentioned it. Stay out of the – constant worry machine of television and uh, especially our news. Uh, yep. I think most people know these days that that's pretty much all it's doing is keeping us in a constant state of worry. And that without a doubt is keeping our dogs and cats, our birds. Uh, it, it's not good to be in a home with a, with a constantly stressed human being. That's right. No, it's, it's not. It's probably one of the, and if you, if you are struggling with mental illness and you're stressed and you have animals, it's fine. <clears throat> you're not going to cause their problems. They're on their path and they may have come to help you. <clears throat> I've known animals where the p parents were trying to get pregnant and this cat came into their life, got developed diabetes, was really ill. But the cat, because they connected with me, who connected with someone to do Reiki on the cat, the cat learned how to do Reiki on the people. And the woman got pregnant. And after she delivered the baby, within a few months, the cat died. And it wasn't, you know, it was that's the cat's path. So acceptance and joy. That's crazy. Even if you're stressed and crazy, accept that you're stressed and acting ridiculous. Sure. And and then, you know, keep working at it, of course. <laughs> but but it's like you're okay. However you are, whatever you're doing with your animals, it's okay because there's no one right answer. But so, Doctor Chambro, let's go into support uh, for folks that. You know, they may not have a, a really great holistic vet like you within driving distance. It might be 45 minutes or longer uh, to find a really great support system, or I call it a healthcare team. Mm -hmm. um, how, do, how do you help people in, the, in those situations? Well, there are a lot of different things nowadays that you can do. So number one is there are several different veterinarians who have created and non-veterinarian Shirley is one who's been around since the early nineties who have websites that are providing Karen Becker with Mercola um, are providing information that will help you learn. Some of them have a Q and a on a regular basis where you can ask questions to help guide you. And then I've mentioned Holistic Actions. As a Holistic Actions member, which is only $27 a month. Mm -hmm. And we, for member, there's some free things you can do. So for free, 
you can take the five lesson holistic healthcare course and learn. If you really spent a month studying that course, following that course, trying that course, your animal's health, by and large, most animals would flourish and you would flourish. So that's for free. We also have a free article on finding a holistic veterinarian. And also my website, which is christinachambro.com, has the same article or similar and free articles on all sorts of different topics. With the finding a veterinarian, here's the thing. Just going to Google doesn't do it. Yeah. Um, if you know that you want a holistic veterinarian, then you are starting on an odyssey. And I know because I've been through it looking for one for my daughter in Melbourne, Florida. <laughs> and I knew what to do, and it was still an odyssey. I didn't happen to know anybody right here. Yep. So here's the thing. Veterinarians, most conventional veterinarians belong to the American Veterinary Medical Association. You go to that website, and that's who's available. Now, you're still going to miss a few that decided not to become members who were probably the better ones. However, with holistic veterinarians, they can be trained in acupuncture, osteopathy, chiropractic, flower essences, essential oils, herbal medicine, all the different Chinese medicine approaches. They may not, most, very few of them can afford to belong to each of those organizations. Yep. Therefore, they may be trained in two or three modalities, and yet they only belong to one of the organizations. So yep. you have to go to every website. There's some general ones, the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association, but they have to belong to that. Yeah. And they might belong to something else instead. Right. They, um, oh. they, they might have, um, they, there's the CIVT website, and that has ones for international veterinarians around the world. But again, they have to belong to that. Okay. Um, and so for each of them, so in this article, it helps, it reminds you of the things I'm saying, and then it gives you all the websites. You think, okay, that's easy. I'll just go to the websites. Whoa, well, no, you've just started. That's just the beginning. So the websites are not very well kept up. <clears throat> and anybody who's a member can be on the website. They may not be very holistic. Yep. They might have done a weekend course. Yeah. They might have become a member and hadn't even been trained in the modality. So the next step is you find you go to the website, you look for people close to you, like an hour or two away even, and then you go to their website, which may or may not be on the website, and and or call them, and then you use your judgment. It's totally conventional. And you go, well, I don't know, maybe this, is, but then you have to go look at who the veterinarians are at the practice. Maybe one of them at yeah. this totally conventional practice is doing the holistic approaches. Yeah. If you call the reception and you ask, um, I'm choosing not to vaccinate, do, will you all still see me? The receptionist may say no. And yet if you're going to the one practitioner who's holistic it's fine. And, but you may not hear that. So yeah. you have to dig in to each of them and see what makes sense. Okay. Then you have a shorter list with phone numbers. Then you call, Oh, he's not here anymore. No, right. she doesn't really do that. Well, um, how do you know how I can reach that person? No, I don't. <laughs> Etc. And so then it, I had 12, narrowed it down to six, narrowed it down to two or well, three, and it was COVID. So two of the three weren't taking new patients. And so I was down to one who turned out to be a really good one. Um, and then you have to find somebody who works well with you. Some veterinarians, conventional and holistic, are really great with the animals, but they suck with people. Yeah. They don't explain anything. They say, you got to do it my way. And then others are really good with educating you and talking to you. But, you know, you get the sense they're not really that good with your animals. Mm. And so often it'll take a couple of visits, wellness yeah. checks. 
And that brings us actually to one more thing that I've forgot. I keep forgetting to mention right yeah. now. If you have an animal that's young, especially if you have an animal that's healthy, go out and buy pet insurance. 60% of people in Sweden have pet insurance, 35, 40% in Britain have pet insurance, and less than 5% in the U.S. have pet insurance. The cost of laboratory testing, x-rays, other diagnostics, which you often need to do holistically, unless you're really good with your energy healing, are, have skyrocketed. Yeah. And your best bet is to get your, you'll save money over the long run if you start early. Yeah. Um, so I do highly recommend that. And it's just as hard to figure out which insurance because it changes all the time. I'm not even going to go there, but just that's your next, you need, it's, it is important to do that. So sometimes here's, here's what I would put on your holistic team. If you can find a vet who's trained in chiropractic and Chinese medicine, they can palpate for where things are off. A chronic ear problem might just need a neck adjustment by a chiropractor. It might not need any drugs, might not need any. That's hands on. That's good for the environment. It's not costing anything. And Chinese medicine can look at the tongue and feel the pulses and tell what's going on energetically. So once a year, go to a veterinarian who's trained in as many modalities as possible, even if it means a long drive. And if your animal doesn't do well with a long drive, that's up to you to work with them to make that an okay thing where they love going in the car with you. And the second is include animal intuitive slash animal communicators slash healers. And these always are working, mostly are working remotely hmm. because you can communicate and you can heal over the worldwide. So hmm. people here can help there, can help anywhere and vice versa. Okay. And I would do that twice a year, once okay. a year with a really, and then you'll have a local vet. If you had to drive two or three hours to get that once a year physical, yep. you'll have a local vet who's either conventional or maybe slightly holistic, mm. or at least nice enough to let you do your thing. Yeah. And please don't get mad at these conventional vets. Um, they just weren't trained to think. And look for an older vet. Often an older conventional vet is a little more likely to think of the whole W-H-O-L-E animal. And then finally, there are veterinarians who do work virtually. Now, this is an iffy sort, sort of thing because um, the legality of it is fraught with problems. But still, veterinarians are choosing to help you by doing that. Sometimes by consulting with your conventional local conventional veterinarian. Okay. And so there are homeopathic ones, but also non-homeopathic ones who can do that. And that will show up in some of the websites or when you call, you can ask about that. It's okay. challenging. I'm not yeah. saying it's easy. <laughs> but very worth it. And you don't have to keep... The great news is once you find somebody great, you get to just work with that person forever and build a relationship like you would your farmer and your rancher. Please hear me, folks. It is it's a you know, I go to my vet. I have a really great relationship with my vet and love love just talking with him. And like honestly, 60 percent of our visit is about current events and his woodworking and this and that. <clears throat> I, cause I know he's going to get right at the issue in between. We're going to talk and he's going to look, I just like him to give an adjustment, maybe a, a couple needles here and there. I just want him to be able to see my dog often and know my dog, put his hands on my dog. And, um, it's honestly, I just think it's cheaper and better over time because when something happens, you're going to get that, you're going to get that attention and care and, and love, uh, from that vet much more than somebody who just sees your dog once a year, or once every two years, 
you know, it's just the way it is. These are, these are just, it's, this isn't difficult. It's just relationships. Yes. And, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I put, I put my health team way up, way up in terms. I think some people treat the per- person that cuts their hair better than they do their vet. And I just don't understand it. <laughs> I just don't. So, so Rob, uh, do you want to share what town you're in and your veterinarian's name? I won't now, but it, I'm in Boulder. I'm in Boulder, Colorado. Oh, okay. And, yeah, and my vet's incredible. He's a formulator of veterinary uh, uh, nutraceuticals, and he has been Holistic Vet of the Year. He's an amazing guy. Um, I think that what's – what's because I, I don't, I don't want to put him in any sort of box because, you know, we work really, really well together. <laughs> so – but I, I will tell you this, that – um, the people who are valuing these relationships are always, always, always going to get the better share of mind, the, the, the focus of that, of that vet on your, on your pet than, yeah. than yep. not. You know? I even say when you're looking for veterinarians, if you've narrowed it down because of, oh, I left out a big chunk. The other place to look when you're looking for a holistic veterinarian is talk to the people that do massage. Talk to the local pet store, Talk, especially if there's a holistic pet store nearby. I mean, you're blessed in Boulder, of course. Um, talk to even breeders and trainers and yeah. you know, look online for holistic breeders and see if there are any of those near you. So that networking is is very important if you can find people locally, groomers, that type of thing. And the other thing, people say, I can't not vaccinate my animals because my groomer, my pet play group insists on vaccines. Yeah. You just need to have conversations with them and don't give in to poisoning them. That that's yeah. You can find options, even if you have to create your own play group using yeah. Nextdoor or Facebook or something like that, you can do it. You don't have to give in to the, those, those requirements. So what I say is when you found somebody that you think might be good, I suggest you invite her out to lunch, get her out of the clinic. Because when you're talking to her in the clinic, she's worried about the surgery and worried about what the tech is doing. And when you're out of the clinic, you can have that woodworking conversation. (laughs) You can get to know them. And, um, you know, and if you have a great vet, Find out what would make a difference for them. Do yeah. they have, you know, are their kids, kid, how can you make a difference for them Yeah. in their life? Is there something you can do for their clinic or for their house call practice or, you know, for their life that would make a difference? Yeah, absolutely. Even if it's just referring a friend, if everybody can do that. We all do this again for, you know, the person who cuts our hair. Um, and you know, these, these folks are so key and the, the, so, you know, this reminds me of a, a quick little story. I have, I have a, a couple incredible doctors for, um, in my life that are just great, integrative, functional, whatever you want to label them, regenerative doctors for, I have one that's in just incredible. I've had that really, a really close relationship for over 25 years. Yeah. My dog, my holistic vet, um, at the time, uh, this isn't when I lived here, but he was pawing his ear so much. He was a yellow lab and I, I fed him raw food from the beginning. It didn't matter. He, he would get, you know, mm-hmm. chronic ear infections here and there. And so one time he was apparently pawing his ear so much that I didn't even see it. Uh, he developed a hematoma. So it got so bad that she, my holistic vet said, look, there's no way around this. We're going to have to do one of those cuts and stitching. And she, she said to me, she goes, Rob, it's, it's gotten so bad that he might even lose his hearing. I, you could have blown me over with a feather. I mean, I, I just couldn't even believe it. I work at home. I know this dog. I mean, it was like a shock. So I go, I call him. I said, okay, let's schedule it. Uh, she said he can lose his hearing during this, uh, during this, um, procedure. I just was devastated. I called my holistic uh, doctor, well, my functional doctor. He told me about a, uh, a homeopathic German 
um, eye drop, eye drops that you could put in the ear. And one of the side effects that they found was it um, dissolved scar tissue. And my dog Owen had scar tissue. So it rang true for him and it rang for me. And I said, I'll, I'll buy it. I'll put these drops in. Four weeks later, he didn't need to have any surgery. And I mean, it was, uh, mm-hmm. I can't even begin, to, be, begin right. to tell you how, like, I can't even believe I'm saying this. That That's how insane that this was when it happened. And my vet said, I, re- I remember it vividly. She said, wait a second. She said, was it in the left ear or the right ear? <laughs> and I said, left ear. And she said, I, I mean, she, and she had seen a lot. She's, you know, she was super brilliant. And so it's what I'm trying to say is having that team where you can call and you get your vet on the phone, you get them to return your phone call or your emails. Gosh, you guys, it's so worth it. And yeah. also it's, that's a beautiful example of who knows what's right and who's what's wrong. I mean, I would tell you that that surgery, there's no chance of deafness. And so where did she get that? So one of the things is anytime any vet, no matter how good they are, top of the line, anytime they say blank negative will happen or you just need to put that in context of in their experience, but it doesn't mean it's true. Yeah, and so don't let it pressure you into doing something. And then on the other hand, you might have done the surgery. It would have gone fine. Ear would have been fine. But eye drops cleared up the ear. That's amazing. That's wonderful. Yeah, amazing. Probably so, silica. <laughs> with that, I think, I think that's a great place to end this show. And this has been a wonderful hour with you, Dr. Shambro. Thank you so much for being with us today. You are welcome. And thank you for all mine. (laughs) Yes. And just real quick, uh, we'll go back to your website. And if you'd like to get a hold of Dr. Chambro, it's Christina, uh, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-A, for those listening on a podcast uh, app, and Chambro, C-H-A-M-B-R-E-A-U.com. And thank you all, everybody. And actually, if you're listening on the podcast, um, I'll give you my email as well, which is a great way to just, you know, contact me. And my signature has a bunch of really cool things for you. And so the email is easy, healthyanimals at, get ready, it's an old one, at AOL.com. Oh my goodness. Okay. So healthy animals at AOL.com. Yes. Great. We'll put that on the screen. So that's, that's another way you can get a hold of me. All right. Great. All right, everybody. Thanks again for joining us, Dr. Shambro. Have a great day. Thank you. And we'll look forward to another show at some point with you. Take care, everybody. Thank you.